I would move towards the first segment for today's event. We have lined an eminent panel to reflect on India's policy framework for climate-friendly cooling and deliberate on the challenges and way forward. This session will be moderated by Dr. Arunabha Ghosh, CEO at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. Dr. Ghosh, may I please request you to take your seat on the stage? I would now li like to take the opportunity to invite our esteemed panelists for today. We have Ms. Kate Hampton, Chief Executive Officer, Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Ma'am, can we please request you to take your seat on the stage? Thank you. We have Mr. Abhay Bhakri, Director General, Bureau of Energy Efficiency. Thank you. We have Ms. Marit Mari Strand, Counselor at the Royal Norwegian Embassy. And lastly, we have Dr. Satish Kumar, President and Executive Director at Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a huge round of applause for our dignitaries seated at the dais. Over to you, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you, Chalak, and good morning to everyone. Of course, it is a real pleasure to be meeting all of you in person. Thank you for applauding us. It's the first time I've heard such loud applause for just sitting down. Uh, hopefully, the applause can be louder once we've delivered something of substance in this conversation. But jokes aside, uh, you know, we, I remember us launching the Sheetal Alliance, I think just before the pandemic hit, just two months or so before the pandemic hit. And so much has changed in that time. Uh, on one hand, of course, we have recognized that uh, the planet and the economy will undergo uh, various types of shocks that we haven't always anticipated or the intensity of them we have not anticipated. But if we can anticipate them, then we can be better prepared for the future. But the other thing we've learned is that we can also bounce back. We can be far more resilient than, uh, than we expected ourselves to be. When we talk about resilience, um, it's, it's important to understand you know, that we are still very much the privileged. Right? We have just gone through and literally are still in the middle of a heat wave. Uh, just last week, I, was, I happened to be in uh, the UK for an India-UK dialogue on climate change. And we had uh, some researchers at Cambridge University presenting to us about the research they're doing on um, building design and heat load in slum redevelopment in Mumbai. Right? And when you, you know, put yourselves in those shoes, then you realize it's a very, very different kind of ambition, aspiration uh, that we need to have in terms of, uh, I think it was Shikha who said, that it has to be about competitiveness, but also about equity. But at the same time, it demonstrates, therefore, how big that market is. You know, um, it's not just from the point of view of an air conditioner or the refrigerant in the air conditioner, but all the range of technologies that can provide sustainable cooling without warming up the planet. Um, so let's get that conversation going. And uh, as I said, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to deliver something of substance to you as we go through this conversation today. The first panel we have for us today um, is looking at the, the policy leg of that stool. We often talk about three legs of, of, of the stool, rather sometimes four. Uh, policy comes first to give that direction to the market. Then comes investment, because investment will not happen unless you think there is a return on that investment that you can be competitive. Then comes technology, and so many of you are leaders on that field, where you look beyond that immediate horizon, look over the horizon, and we'll have that session on technology. But of course, all of that also must lead up to the fourth leg of the stool, uh, which is the behavioral change. I'm happy to at least observe that in this very building, the, the cooling seems to be a little bit more sustainable than I have observed in the past. Um, so clearly, things are moving in some right direction. Um, enough from me. Let me first, of course, 
introduce the eminent panel that we have. We have, of course, with us Mr. Abe Bakre, the Director General of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. Those who don't know the Bureau of Energy Efficiency better get to know. Those who do know should encourage and, and support and, and partner with the Bureau of Energy Efficiency for the, the, for the revolutionary work it has done and will continue to do in India's energy transformation. Mr. Bakre has also been um, the Executive Director of the Environment Directorate of the Ministry of Railways, the Joint Development Commissioner of the Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, and was the Nodal Officer for National Manufacturing Competitiveness Program. We also have with us Ms. Kate Hampton, on my immediate right, the CEO of the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, which is the world's largest philanthropy that focuses specifically on improving the lives of children. Before joining CIF, Kate was the head of policy at Climate Change Capital and has also advised policymakers as the senior policy advisor for the UK's G8 and the EU presidencies in 2005 and was a Sherpa for the EU High Level Group on Competitiveness, Energy and Environment in 2007. Thank you, Kate, for joining us. We also have with us uh, Ms. Marit Strand, who is the counsellor at the Royal Norwegian Embassy uh, here in Delhi, but she's been associated with NORAD overlooking economic governance and policy analysis. She was earlier the country economist at the Norwegian Embassy in Maputo in Mozambique with a broad portfolio including budget support, financial management reforms, tax reforms, and dialogues concerning extractive industries. And of course, I'm sure many of you already very well know Dr. Satish Kumar, um, from whom I have learned for more than a decade a pretty much everything I know about energy efficiency. Um, Dr. Kumar is the president and executive director of the Alliance for Energy Efficient Economy. Prior to AEEE, he was the energy efficiency ambassador and led the energy management business at Schneider Electric in India and was also a scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. We have to ask ourselves the big question of what are the challenges in moving that policy direction forward uh, in terms of how India moves to a sustainable development pathway. So let me ask uh, an opening question to all of you and I want a very quick response. I do have more dedicated questions, but given that we are having this conversation in the middle of this severe heat wave, right? Every time I'm on a call with anyone from outside India, they say, let me first start by extending our concern and commiserations for the challenges that you and your citizens and your fellow citizens are, failing, uh, are facing. So my opening question to all of you is, India led the world by being the first to have a cooling action plan. Um, is that enough? Let me start with Mr. Bakri. Uh, Mr. Bakri, if you could use the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ronova, and uh, good morning to all here, my eminent panelist here. India Cooling Action Plans was uh, one of the comprehensive document, let me say, and it was uh, one of the effective step uh, making a, a, a kind of a pathway, and it was one of the earlier step, earliest step here. It was not enough in terms that perhaps the implementation was not defined and perhaps it was envisaged that implementation will be taken forward through other other policy mechanisms. Even it is there today and we are discussing even if we have the ICAP since 2019, what have we done for the implementation? So the question is that yes, uh, it was a good document, it was a clear roadmap, but the implementation was not uh, defined uh, in a much detailed or in a uh, with clarity and who will do what and when they will do what, most important, when will do. So that was missing, but that was to be uh, done by subsequent efforts, which maybe perhaps the COVID has not allowed us to do it as Which expected. is why we are having this yeah. conversation today. All right. Uh, Kate? So I remember back in, uh, in Kigali, 
Um, everybody was waiting to see which annex India would be in. And it was pretty clear to me, speaking to Indian policymakers and civil society at the time, that India understood the urgency, understood the risks, understood the opportunity almost more than others because of uh, the brutal heat that affects so many in the country on such a regular basis and that that was accelerating. But there were deep concerns about the ability to implement quickly in a way that wasn't appropriate to India's national circumstances, that it wouldn't be done in an equitable way, that it could be costly, that India didn't have the manufacturing base and so on. So there was disappointment about where India landed at that time, but I was pretty confident that with continued engagement and investment, India would become a leader in this space because it, it's clearly a national imperative and a national opportunity. So I was really excited to see India ratify the Kigali Amendment last year. I was really excited to see the action plan. And actually, when you look at the range of commitments in NDCs, India's... India's cooling action plan stands as a model. Um, many countries could do more in terms of bringing together energy efficiency and HFC phase down in their NDCs. And it could be a major pillar in helping us keep 1.5 degrees open for the most vulnerable countries and communities in the world. So for me, a plan is a first step. And the patience with which uh, India has proceeded, has actually enabled integration in a really interesting way. And I think now India's ready for takeoff, but a plan is never enough, right? Sure. Collaboration, implementation, accountability, we've got to keep learning and we've got to do it together. Indeed. Uh, Ms. Strand. Thank you. Um, Should be on. Okay, yeah. there. I, I just had to get a uh, little bit closer. I mean, you were definitely asking for a no, it's not enough. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think we'll come back to other supporting policies later. But right now, I think that it's very Im important to help support the actual implementation, which is why we are working together with the partners in India with the various pilot projects to see how we can actually do this. And, on, and as to the subject, uh, is the transition going fast enough? I mean there is a definitely risk of a technological lock-in. I mean, once buildings have been built and systems have, but have been uh, uh, installed, it's much more expensive to uh, rectify that later. So it is very ur urgent given the very rapid uh, building uh, of uh, new cities, malls, and uh, so forth. So, so yes, I do feel it is very urgent. Thank you. Satish? Um, thanks, uh, Arunava, and um, uh, so, um, so I would uh, like to start by saying that uh, the development of the ICAP, I think the way it was developed, many of the folks that I see in this room were involved in the development, was itself uh, a major milestone because uh, it has numbers, it has data, and it has uh, uh, some short, medium, and long-term recommendations, I think, which was very, very important. But it is a plan, as Mr. Bakre said, that it is a plan. Uh, and um, I think having been very closely involved with the MFCCIC, Professor Agrawal, and others in the room, I think the philosophy behind the development of the ICAP was that this is not going to create new policies. This is going to bring together all the policies that are already, I think, by Bureau of Energy Efficiency, by Ministry of Housing, by Ministry of Agriculture. And also, I think the expectation is that the, a lot of the implementation and recommendations, MOEFCC is a nodal ministry, it cannot lead that. It can coordinate that. So I think the way some of the uh, work is happening post the launch of the ICAP is, I think, passing the baton to the line ministries and see how can MOEFCC facilitate, I think, the implementation of the India Cooling Action Plan. And here I would say that we need to realize, and this is not just with ICAP, but I think I'm sure Mr. Bakre will agree with, that even for a program like ECBC or Building Energy Codes, a lot is dependent on other ministries. A lot is dependent on states and I think in local cities in terms of how do they develop, what kind of capacity gets built there. So it's a, it's a, in some ways it is a tough challenge and I'm very happy that SIF has given us an opportunity to actually work uh, on, on this very, very challenging and exciting project. 
But if you ask me that what we can do, I think you're a little bit better. I would say that the interministerial coordination that I think both B as well as um, um, MOEFCC, I think they have done a terrific job, I think, in terms of putting some of these plans out there. Mm -hmm. But is that the topmost priority for other ministries for whatever reasons? I think, is it, are they prioritizing it? Okay. Is there budget available? I think that piece is something that where we can do better, I, in my opinion. So in a way, actually, uh, Satish, your response leads me straight into the question I had specifically for you and Mr. Bakri. Um, we already know that the BE star labeling program has been a major success, not just for appliances in general, but particularly for air conditioners. Minimum energy performance standards have improved by 43% for split type ACs, uh, which constitute about 90% of our market. But this is something that you know a single entity could do, right? Because you have control over the, the, the establishment of the standards. Now you're saying this implementation, Mr. Bakri, you refer to implementation, Satish, you're talking about implementation across line ministries, across state governments. Tell us, reflect a little bit about what, does something need to change on policy and regulation or something needs to change on coordination of how this point that both of you are raising can actually happen, if, you know, broadening it beyond what's within your particular mandate. So maybe again, Mr. Bakri first, if you could go. Yeah, in fact, that's the, uh, that's the uh, key issue here. Um, as rightly said, it's actually a planned document. But to some extent, it detailed out almost everything which could be done and, and, or which should be done in the country to take India to a leadership uh, to, and uh, depending on the, and the opportunity what we see here, India stands to have gain a leadership in next four to five years. Coming back to your specific uh, question, every implementation, if we just leave it as it is a, a plan, it, it is a planned document, if we don't think about the implementation, we don't define. And uh, coming to specific to Indian uh, uh, institutional arrangement, there has to be one uh, clear set of either a unit or a department. I don't want to use the bureaucratic words here. A unit or a team he is responsible or accountable as very rightly said, accountable to make sure that whatever has been written here or whatever has been uh, expected in that document has to be delivered by whoever has been uh, written. So as Dr. Satish Kumar rightly said, there are different um, agencies, organizations, departments who are involved, whether it's ECBC, whether it's uh, cooling or cold chain, etc. But there has to be a clear one unit who has to own the responsibility. In the Indian government, like if you just give an example of NMEEE, the mission which, which is given, which was given to BEE, we are piloting it. Uh, but then it involves steel ministry, cement, uh, uh, civil aviation, railways, refineries. There are so at least 10 ministries are involved. But then the main accountability has been given to BEE. So that accountability of ICAP, MOEFCC is a ministry for the coordination. But there has to be a cohesive unit uh, which has to take care that, yes, they are accountable to make sure that other departments or uh, actors who are supposed to actually take action have to do it. And uh, if you ask the question whether the B is supposed to be mended, uh, right now I don't see that because I think as Dr. Satushima rightly said, it is defined who is supposed to do what. But the question is that who will actually take uh, the full responsibility of making sure that whatever is written is takes, taken forward. Yeah, that's so, the main so, thing. So, Satish, what would be that institutional home to drive this forward more urgently? Yeah, so, um, uh, I think if you could use the microphone, uh, Satish, thank you. Sorry, um, um, it's, a, it's a tough question, uh, Arunaba. And uh, uh, in terms of, because as, uh, as I think uh, Mr. Bakre is also pointing out, that there are certain, I, I think, uh, policies or regulations which are very clear cut where the responsibilities do get defined very clearly. And I think in the lead up to the, I think the ICAP development, this question was continuously getting asked that, okay, this is a plan. And I think the way it was resolved, and I don't know, I think whether that's the best way, but that's how it is happening, that there will be a steering committee at the MOEFCC level where they will invite all the nodal ministries, I think, if who are responsible, 
and whether it is a space cooling topic or whether it's a cool uh, it's a cold chain topic mm -hmm. and madam secretary actually um, had convened a cold chain working group and i think he, she was actually going um, i think the ministry by ministry right. and saying that these are the recommendations right. where are we what are the challenges right. that you are finding right. uh, how can we help so right. i think the ministry of environment has not let it go i mean it is tracking and it is asking but she also said i think if it was very heartening and heartwarming that we are not doing enough i think if, i expect i think he more the ministries to actually uh, spend i think he more time send more senior people in this and not just do a check the box that we have to just go and give an update Indeed. so that is on the this side i'll just take one minute arunabha mm -hmm. uh, mr bakre talked about room air conditioner mm. i want to come to fans actually i think mm -hmm. the fans in my opinion is the primary thermal comfort providing appliance for indian masses mm -hmm. and we have an opportunity we were doing some calculation we have about 500 to 600 million fans that are installed in india and if we want to replace and cut down the energy consumption by by fans by 50% we are talking about a 1 lakh crore investment a significant investment that we are talking about and this is something that we are working on but if you look at the gigawatts that it is going to save it is equivalent to about 15 gigawatts and it is something that india has done through ujala i think when we did the i think big roll out of led program it's very similar it's a plug and play technology it is available and i think it through bulk procurement we can make these i think the appliances available to affordable homes mm -hmm. which they would otherwise never be able to buy because it will be more expensive but we can bring down the cost so i feel that i think the climate finance i think the government of india if we are investing i think the tens or hundreds of crores in hydrogen infrastructure development we need to have parallel demand side interventions which are also going to give us big sure. bucks actually sure. so that's i think is something that uh, i just wanted my, to put my, on it. my senior colleague shalu agarwal is not here uh, but she has been leading that work on energy efficient super efficient fans and how we can convince the distribution companies etc also to buy into that story but uh, this point that both you uh, you've made about uh, you know how do we scale things up i wanted to come to kate and Marit, on this question, both of you talked about, you know, India's overall ambitions, how we can push that ahead um, faster and higher. Uh, one of the parallels I see is to what Satish was saying. You know, vaccination is a you know, Ministry of Health issue, right? But when the pandemic hit, R and D for that is happening somewhere else. manufacturing is happening somewhere else the policy design is happening somewhere else financing is happening somewhere else right suddenly what is an ind individual ministry issue becomes a national issue and you know with uh, i remember how much we were all struggling exactly 12 months ago in may of 2021 and yet 1.5 billion vaccines have been administered right so how do we kate i think you use the word urgency uh, or i think marit you also said so could you reflect a little bit from say a strategic philanthropy side and from a strategic sort of development partner side marit uh, how do we bring that the new dimensions of cooling whether it's in cold chain infrastructure whether it is again storage of vaccines that can help you know improve the life chances of children how do we create more avenues in the sustainable cooling space and yet with that sense of urgency kate first you the the cooling space has always been a, a challenge i remember when we set up the kagali um cooling efficiency um partnership bringing together the two communities even just of people working on energy efficiency standards and montreal protocol reg regulation they'd never spoken to each other and the energy efficiency people were like we'll drive this through energy efficiency regulation and the montreal protocol people were like all the ambition comes from the montreal protocol implementing instruments and actually getting them to collaborate and see the value of each other was a, a real mindset shift for the community and we now have to expand that way beyond even those two communities but the playbook is 
straightforward. Uh, we, you know, innovation is well understood as a process. You know, R&D, demonstration, deployment. It's all about the enabling environment, and it's all about sending very, very clear investment signals that are bankable uh, for the private sector where they have to play. So for all of these areas, setting the ambition level is number one, but then it has to be backed up with clear regulatory guidelines, and the financial institutions have to come in behind. Public financial institutions have to address uh, uh, barriers, um, whether it's cost of capital or, or, or other issues that may address the fact that you might have higher upfront capex, but lower opex, those kinds of, of, of issues. So there are going to be distributional issues, which government will have to come in from a social protection perspective. There will be financial issues to overcome those barriers. There will be coordination issues that require the kind of governance that we're talking about, where the level of seniority and coordination across ministries is going to be absolutely crucial. But number one is always going to be, is the government clear on their goals, and is the envir enabling environment sufficient to mobilize private capital behind it? So I think the playbook is, 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 is very clear. But it does require a very national conversation and a very local conversation about the most appropriate technologies. You know, in Europe, our preoccupation is heating. The next thing on the pathway to significant emissions reductions in Europe is heating. Um, and, and you're getting into people's homes. Uh, you're talking about energy poverty. Um, and that's just, you know, heating in Europe. The, the problems are amplified in countries with higher levels of, of poverty. So it has to be a whole of society conversation. That can't be led by one ministry. It can't be done in silos. And the cross-cutting enabling environment is going to be crucial. But the private sector will follow. This is a $180 billion industry in 2030. Uh, there is massive opportunity. So with the right signals, I think, I think the private sector will come flying in. We have a lot of the private sector here in this room. We'll, we'll learn from them soon whether they will Take, pick up the bait or not, but Marit, you've been, and, and, the, and the Norwegian Embassy and Norwegian uh, research institutions have been partnering with uh, entities here on a range of technologies, etc. So how do you see that sense of urgency driving new directions of sustainable cooling? Well, um, I think uh, Kate made a very important point uh, that it has to be set in the and local context. Uh, it has to be adapted uh, to the local policies and, and local uh, en environment. And um, when we have our institutional cooperations uh, with Indian uh, um, institutions, I would like to make it very clear that this is also a learning experience for our institutions, because they are learning how to adapt their knowledge to a new context. And I think that it's very positive to see how it, this very quickly turns into joint work. Uh, and I think that's a very important point, that you can't come in from the outside with ready-made solutions and say that this is how things should be done. Uh, you have to uh, work together to find out what is the joint solution. And the title here is uh, India as a, as a leading uh, country. And I think it's very, very important that the experiences that India is actually um, uh, making now should be uh, shared with other countries and actually used, uh, because I think it's actually much more relevant how things have been solved in uh, India. So, I'm, so we really think that the next step from our point of view is to look at more tripartite uh, cooperations with other countries. Thank you. That's a great uh, point. Thank you, Marit. In fact, we were just discussing offline how you know Indian industry is of of course looking at competitiveness within the economy, but also in the export market. But the export market is not. I mean, as I see it, this is a question. This is a session on policy. We'll talk about competitiveness and R and D subsequently in the day. But the export market is not just the export of equipment. It's also the export of policy design and market design and uh, you know. Um, government procurement to drive down costs, uh, you know, all those lessons that can be shared with other countries that then create the, the equipment market as well. But uh, Satish and Mr. Bakri, if I may turn back to you about a slightly different tilt. Now, we've been talking a lot about 
you know, what is the here and now issues that are driving the market forward? And, and Kate and Marriott have been talking about how to drive that more urgently. Now let's work backwards. Uh, Mr. Bakri and I were at a different session just yesterday uh, talking to Indian diplomats about our net zero commitments. Now we've made a commitment of net zero emissions by 2070. Uh, working backwards from there, what do you see the role of sustainable cooling, which is in a country which is going to present the fastest growth rates in cooling demand in the world? Uh, the global ambition of removing about half a degree of warming potentially when we are just about to break through the 1.5C barrier in a few years from now, that half a degree of warming can be a significant avoidance. But if I may play the devil's advocate for a second, uh, I see that the cooling sector is also buffeted by a series of challenges. Is the regulatory environment changes fairly regularly, right? We had, um, uh, there is, uh, there was of course originally the Montreal Protocol, then came the Kigali Amendment, then, you know, there are energy efficiency mandates that kick in. Now there is a net zero story. So, I would not be surprised if someone from industry said, you know, give us a break. <laughs> but at the same time, if I put my policy, academic, analyst, uh, and sort of planetary hat on, I would say, no, none of us gets that break. We got to keep driving forward. So the question to both of you is, you know, how do we nudge in a sustainable way for industry to move towards that net zero pathway while not deindustrializing? Yeah, in fact, uh, that's the, uh, the, the main discussion if we really try to answer the, the, the question here on the back side. How do we really get India into that uh, leading position of sustainable cooling? Uh, so we are clear what we are supposed to do. And in fact, the answer lies to a very simple statement which uh, perhaps my friends here in, from industry uh, have heard me saying many, uh, many times earlier. How can we take India as the most uh, hub for the most efficient air conditioning manufacturer? Okay. So that's the statement I have made and, uh, and mostly the answer lies there. Uh, I'll take three steps in that. Uh, I'll take the demand, then technology and then finance because both the three, both three. Uh, and how do we really uh, achieve that? And that's a very clear uh, policy um, uh, vision which we can define now or even uh, in for the next five years. As you know, you talked about the net zero we yesterday discussed here. In net zero itself, when we get there or uh, uh, we have the uh, backward calculation, we broadly define, uh, divide into two areas, the supply and the demand. Supply, 500 gigawatt and uh, the power generation, uh, broadly we can. But the main, uh, uh, the main interventions or the flexibility or the opportunities really lie in the demand sector. So if we come to the cooling and uh, let me say this, that the cooling sector is going to be having the highest growth at least in next two uh, decades, even perhaps more than what we expect for steel or cement or even for power generation. So in the cooling sector, if we, if we again divide two things, the, the actions to be done by the, uh, the industry, which again I say is from a supply chain, and the uh, actions to be done by the consumers, the, the actual demand side. So the policies have to be in such a manner that the demand will drive uh, demand will drive the supply the supply will then transform themselves uh, in a manner that to in, uh, infuse more and more technology more efficient obviously over time and finally that demand with the new technologies will actually invite automatically the need for finance and that sure. will start from the policy for i will just give a very small example if we see uh, the cooling commercial sector and the residential sector can we start have a, having a, a clear ca a clear mandate or even a campaign? All air conditioning in office buildings, hotels, all commercial spaces be, uh, of more than 10 years old have to be replaced in next two years. If that itself will drive a clear demand, because whatever industry is going to manufacture now or deploy now will be double, will be having double the efficiency because in 2010 or 11, our efficiency was double, uh, the, the efficiency was half than what we have today. So it's a clear demand and that's a huge opportunity. As soon, have, as, soon as you have this replacement campaign, 
you will need uh, additional campaign uh, for uh, new requirement as well as the replacement. So that itself will push the market, the economy of scale. And finally, you will get the new technologies coming up. There will be a good competition and financing. Uh, uh, the investment will start uh, pouring up for each and, and that will drive the full campus. So this is one policy lever I am uh, seriously thinking that we should drive. There are many such things like that. You should definitely take note of that. Satish, before you answer, I am just going to uh, apologize and quickly excuse myself because the Honorable Minister's office has informed that he's already on his way. So I'm going to step away and go down to receive him while Shikha will take over. But the homework assignment is there for you. But let me give the homework assignment to Marietta and Kate as well. Uh, we are talking with uh, you know, Indian industry here in terms of moving towards net zero. Well, how can the international community help move our sustainable cooling uh, market um, in that direction. So you have your questions. I will quickly go receive the minister and join you in a few minutes. One step closer to taking his job. <laughs> <laughs> Can we start with you, perhaps, Marit, yeah. on the... Uh, so yeah, uh, Shika, so I think to respond to um, Arunaba's question, I would uh, address it in three parts. Like one is the design piece. I think we are not talking about the building design because if you look at, I think, the lean, mean, and green philosophy, we feel that the biggest opportunity to reduce the cooling demand itself happens at the time when the building is designed. And India is very different because we still have many, many buildings yet to be designed and brought online, unlike Europe or US. So I think that's one of the biggest opportunities. The challenges that we sometimes see that we have Ikonivas Samita, but at the same time, we see industry going with a technology called My One technology, which is a concrete wall that is getting, I think, used in affordable housing construction for the reason that it is speeds up and it is it can be actually reduce the cost of construction. But if you do the energy analysis, it's the worst kind of thing. It will turn the building into a furnace. So I think there are these kind of disconnects that we see, which we need to plug in when we are really looking at the design. And I think I'm very happy that I think AEEE is involved in Solar Decathlon India, which is kind of producing the next generation of net zero uh, energy building design professional. The second piece is the technology. And I talked a little bit about, I think, the fans. But let me also put it in the context that we also have room air conditioner, which is the big elephant in the room. We all talk about it because that's the trajectory, I think, that is being forecast that it will lead to enormous demand on the power grid also. And we have a 5x technology by Global Cooling Prize. I see Dr. Reddy, Department of Science and Technology, kind of led that program. But now the thing is that how, do, how does India create an ecosystem where Indian manufacturers or multinational companies which are setting up shops in India become the manufacturer of those technology? As we have the last piece is the climate finance piece. I think we talked about how do you get one lakh crore for a demand side intervention or how does India has already started giving incentives in the form of PLI schemes to room air conditioner manufacturers. Perhaps it can be extended to fans and others, but also how do you work with multilateral institutions to create compelling proposals, not 100 crore, not 500 crore, but literally tens of thousands of crores, which will actually bring in the financing that will lead to the sustainable cooling transition. Yeah, I think that leads really beautifully, actually, uh, with some really hard questions for both Kate and Merit. Um, the climate finance that we keep talking about, um, I think the, the black hole image that we saw yesterday is, is an easier find than the 100 billion that we keep talking about. Um, so what is your sort of takeaway when we think about net zero and we think about sustainable cooling for a hot tropical country like India, um, with Satish pointing out that these technologies need to be adapted to the Indian conditions and in a lot of cases also need to be developed for the Indian conditions in particular. Um, so how can we look to the international community? What are the kinds of support that we should be thinking about? And how is the international community really thinking about sustainable cooling in India? Um, 
Thank you. Uh, and um, well, I felt that that was a question to Norway, really. <laughs> and um, Norway takes our commitment to climate financing very seriously. And we have fulfilled our commitment so far and will uh, strive to continue to do so. When it comes to India, uh, we have already committed a $100 million uh, for new, in new investments. Uh, Please continue, Mayer. <laughs> Thank you. I was just talking about Norway's commitments to invest in renewable energy <laughs> in uh, India, uh, and that is, is uh, moving forward. When it comes to the cooling agenda, uh, we have seen it as, as relevant to work together with institutions and industry and share our technology. Um, and and uh, getting to the point uh, which you made, uh, I mean, to find, um, uh, to make it easier for the in industry to actually uh, invest in these matters. That is why we have worked together with CEW and other partners on concrete projects on the grounds to show how it is possible to do this in uh, a mall or in a hotel and, and use a very much alternative uh, ways of both heating and cooling and involving Indian vendors. This is a very important point that we actually build up the Indian vendor capacity and we do this all over the country and not just in one place. Um, I do want to make and it warmed my heart <laughs> to hear that you uh, also raised the issue of um, efficient buildings. That is a such important point, and that is definitely an area where we all should be striving to do more. Norway, the um, energy price in Norway has tripled uh, within just a few months. It was an unfortunate uh, drought combined with the crisis in uh, y Ukraine, and that has probably done more for energy efficiency in Norway than any policy we have set. <laughs> Um, so the availability of uh, climate finance is a, a constant source of disappointment and US Congress's inability <laughs> to liberate funds uh, in line with COP26 commitments and other things is something that the community is working on. I think it's important to, to look at the, the, the big picture. Um, multilateral development banks are sitting on $4 trillion of assets which are leveraging only one-to-one -one with the private sector. That is failing on their mandate. Uh, this is a priority development issue, and we absolutely have to get the cost of capital down for countries that need to invest in large-scale cooling technologies, and that has to be a, a huge priority for the development sector. Um, in terms of climate finance, the 100 billion isn't even enough, and we need to go well beyond that. Um, and you'll remember in COP26, this coalition called GFANS of, of private capital stood up and said, yes, we're going to invest lots in, in, in net zero, et cetera. That money will not flow without public finance accompanying it. All it will do is endlessly refinance wind farms in Europe because those are really easy assets to finance. It's not going to flow to developing countries without a really concerted effort globally to ensure that the cost of capital is brought down and the risk premia are, are addressed, uh, most of which are, are not based on, on facts on the ground. So I think there is a, a massive problem in terms of the scale of, at which we are thinking about climate finance and the range of institutions and instruments that need to deploy that to get the private capital to flow. Because there's plenty of private capital sitting around in pension funds with close to zero yields doing nothing, which is a crime when there is so much need around the world. It is unacceptable to have that amount of lazy private capital sitting around doing nothing when the multilateral development banks have four trillion in assets that could help mobilize that and developed countries haven't fulfilled their climate finance promises. This has to be the number one priority. I would also say, I mean, the question was, what can the international community do to help India? I would also say, what can India do to help the international community? If India can develop large-scale manufacturing of products that are appropriate for uh, low-income settings uh, with the same heat wave patterns um, as India, 
that will be transformative. At the moment, what we have is environmental dumping of poor uh, equipment in Africa. Uh, we have solutions that are too expensive for individuals. Uh, but we've got in ISA, the, India has one of these, the great climate diplomacy institutions of the world emerging. The initiative to solarize uh, cooling that's emerging at ISA could be a truly transformative international collaborative platform to accelerate. And that will have huge benefits for Indian industry because India has the scale and the policy capability and now the vision with the action plan and the ratification of Kigali to be a real leader um, in, in, in that market. So I think India, as the world begins to take climate change more seriously, and we all need to push institutions to really address the financial barriers that are at stake and get private capital to flow, um, we also need to recognize that it is a huge market opportunity for, for India, and the vision that has been set out is one that many, many, many other countries can follow and, and, and benefit from. Very encouraging, actually, to hear about the need um, to break away and look at sustainable cooling not just as a mitigation uh, sector, but actually as an adaptation sector, right? And, and use that really as a hook to, to pull public and private financing. And it's, uh, it's also really encouraging that we have BEE up on stage with us, right? Because the kind of financing that the Bureau has attracted, uh, you know, towards promoting sustainable cooling products uh, at different levels of uh, the demography um, has been a real game changer. And I think that those are lessons not just for India, but for the world to take on. Um, I think uh, I would now like to very politely hand back over to Arunabha um, to kindly welcome the Honorable Minister Sir here. First of all, I want to thank uh, the esteemed panelists, um, Honorable Minister Yadav. I was in the middle of asking them tough questions <laughs> when you timed your entry. So they got let off the hook, uh, so to speak. But uh, you know, again, <laughs> jokes aside, we are having a serious conversation about a serious issue, um, but also where we believe that India um, has already taken a lot of leadership and how we can take this work forward. Uh, India was a leading part of getting the Kigali Amendment done to the Montreal Protocol. Uh, last year, uh, India ratified the Kigali Amendment, something that some other countries have not done yet. Um, India was the first um, country in the world to have a comprehensive cooling action plan the BR its pledge. Um, so there are a number of things that have happened on the policy side and um, the conversation we were ha having uh, as you were on your way was about what more has to happen on the policy and the institutional architecture. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change is the nodal ministry, but as we can see, cooling is for everyone. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room uh, who grew up throwing water on the, in the balcony and putting a charpai, and that was sustainable cooling for us, right? That is how we grew up, right? The, before even a desert cooler came. Then the desert cooler came, and the entire family slept in the same room, right? So uh, we are talking about hundreds of millions of people in India and, and across the world who will need access to sustainable cooling. So first of all, my uh, sincere thanks to the panelists here. Uh, Kate Hampton, Mr. Abhay Bakre, uh, Ms. Maris Tran, and Dr. Satish Kumar for enlightening us. Also gives me great pleasure to formally welcome Sri Bhupendra Yadav, the Honorable Minister for Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, and Labor and Employment for the Government of India. Sri Yadav has been a member of parliament uh, in the Rajya Sabha, representing Rajasthan since 2012. Over the years, he has served as the chairman and member of several key parliamentary committees, including but not limited to the Committee on Subordinate Legislation member and the Committee on Personnel, Public Grievances, Law and Justice. But those of you who have known him for about 10 months now in the, in the ministry 
would have known the significant leadership he has demonstrated um, in Glasgow, the transformative pledges that India has made, but also those who even attempt to track his intensive engagement across the country will know that he is constantly on the ground talking to stakeholders on a range of environmental issues. And that is why this range of stakeholders we have today from, uh, from industry, from civil society, um, from academia, we would very much welcome the opportunity to engage with you. So thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for joining us today.